Chapter Five of Put Thy Love in Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Five. It was the night of the raffle. On that occasion, the library hall of the Young Ladies' Sodality was almost uncomfortably crowded. The workers in the bazaar, and their number was legion, were all present, and so were their friends and their friends friends to about the fourth degree the librarian smiling and affable was showing not without pride the treasures of the library to several portly gentlemen one of whom as his features indicated was of jewish blood a whisper went round among the workers that he was as rich as caresses that's the way it started but by the time it had passed from one mouth to fifty it was crept into he's as rich as crazy whereupon the uninitiated gazed on him fixedly, many wondering whether he was as harmless as he appeared to be. Did the librarian know he was crazy? they asked themselves. Apparently she did not, for her easy air of smiling unconcern, and her light laugh, rich in cheerfulness, evinced that she was utterly without fear. He doesn't look crazy, Regina was saying to the secretary of the sodality. Crazy? I should think not, returned the official. He's a very good, sensible man, and has been one of the best friends of our bazaar, even if he is a Jew. By the way, do you know that you and he have done more to bring in money on the diamond ring than any two people in the city? Him and me? cried Regina, the color rushing to her pale cheeks. Why, I didn't do anything to speak of. I just got three books filled. Yes, but all the same, your name is down for more chances than his, and he paid down cash for fifty in my presence besides other chances I've heard he's taken. At this moment the prefect of the stality, accompanied by the two assistants, came over to where Regina was seated. "'Miss O'Connell,' said the prefect, "'in the name of our sodality and the orphans, we wish to thank you for the work you have done in the interests of our raffle. If there were a dozen more like you in our sodality, I think we should practically own the town.' "'Thank you, Miss Dalton,' said Regina, rising in some confusion, her face, which had grown pale and wan since we last saw her, flushed violently. "'And I do hope,' added the first assistant kindly, "'that you may win it.' "'And so do I,' said the second assistant, her eyes beaming genially through her glasses. "'I'm sorry I can't agree with you,' said the librarian, as she pushed her way up to the group, along with the man who was rich as crazy. "'Here's my candidate for the ring. He wants it, and, if he wins it, he intends to present us with fifty dollars for our library. "'Oh, dear!' cried Regina. "'If that's the case, I—I I almost hope he'll win.' "'Let me suggest an amendment,' said the prefect. "'Mr. Fairweather, I propose that, in case you win or Miss Regina O'Connell, you give the fifty dollars. "'You see, Mr. Fairweather, Regina has worked harder for that ring than any one.' and in the number of chances taken she is your rival. Mr. Fairweather looked at Regina kindly and benevolently. He took in much of her story at a glance. Had she been the finest lady in the land, he could not have been more courteous. It is indeed a pleasure, he said, bowing, to meet a rival in such a cause. They are not the kind I usually meet, I am sorry to say. Miss Dalton, he went on, I'm obliged to you for the suggestion. I shall be delighted to give your library fifty dollars if I win, sixty dollars if Miss O'Connell be the lucky one. Oh, my goodness, cried the librarian, I do hope things will go as they ought to. Mr. Fairweather, you are so good and kind that I will add another suggestion. In case neither of you win, we may count upon twenty-five dollars anyhow, may we not? What do you say to that, Miss Dalton? said Mr. Fairweather, smiling benevolently. It's a brilliant suggestion. The librarian laughed lightly and glided away. She knew that the matter was settled. Somewhat to Regina's dismay, the old gentleman seated himself beside her. Is he crazy? she asked herself. But even if he were not, it would be an ordeal to make talk with a man whose daily income exceeded her entire earnings of a year. Presently, nevertheless, she found herself talking easily, frankly, about her sister, and all the circumstances of her lovely death. Next, she was listening intently to Mr. Fairweather, who, despite a slight German accent, spoke with a noble impressiveness. He was conversing about death, 
and saying how much he wondered at the quiet, calm way in which good Catholics await the final summons. Had he been a priest, his sentiments would have been perfectly appropriate. Just then a hale old gentleman clapped his hands for silence. He was standing on a raised platform. "'Ah, that's Mr. Dalton,' whispered Mr. Fairweather to Regina. "'What? The father of Miss Dalton?' "'Yes, and one of the finest men in town. If all your rich Catholics were like him, you wouldn't need bazaars.' "'Ladies and gentlemen,' Mr. Dalton was saying, "'I have the honor to announce to you that we are now going to find out to whom the diamond ring belongs. We are going to go about it in this way. In this bag—' Here Mr. Dalton gravely held up a white sack, upon whose chaste surface there shone out in blue characters, XXX, finest brand. In this bag are all the numbers taken by the various chance-takers. Out of this bag the lucky number will be taken. The first, second, and third numbers will not count. No, the thirteenth number taken out will be the lucky one. Now we want a little boy, the littler the better, to take out the numbers, and one man to read them out, and another man to verify his reading. Mr. Fairweather, couldn't you— Excuse me, if you please, Mr. Dalton, interrupted Mr. Fairweather, but I hope to win that ring myself. Get someone who isn't quite so interested. A small boy and two men were presently secured. Mr. Dalton shook the sack energetically, then opening its mouth slightly, bade the urchin thrust in his hand and bring forth one slip of paper. The boy obeyed and gave the slip to the announcer. Seventeen twenty-eight, he called. Seventeen twenty-eight, cried the verifier. Again the bag was shaken. Nineteen eleven, twenty-three eighty-four, forty-eight twenty-three, ninety eighty-nine. 402, 3112, 21, 1118, 2124, 3560, 832. Now, ladies and gentlemen, cried Mr. Dalton in a loud voice, though he might have spoken in a whisper, and been heard, so tense was the silence. The next number is the winning number. May the one who gets it deserve it. Whereupon he began to shake the bag with comical violence. The laughing that followed suddenly changed to a groan as the mouth of the sack slipped in his hand and a number of tickets flew through the air and fell scattering upon the floor. The crowd moved back and the workers were upon their knees at once recovering the precious slips. Say, whispered the librarian into the ear of the kneeling prefect, while you're down there say a little prayer that Regina O'Connell may win. Isn't she a dear little thing? We've all been praying for her, answered the prefect. Quickly the slips were recovered, quickly were they returned into the sack, and violently, but with much more care, did Mr. Dalton shake it for the last time. The boy took out a slip and handed it to the announcers. Number 306. Ah, came involuntarily from the mouth of Miss Dalton. Number 306, announced Mr. Dalton, finding the corresponding stump in a book handed him. Miss Regina O'Connell. At this there was tremendous applause. "'It's one of the ten chances that Father McNichols took for her,' whispered the prefect to the librarian. At the mention of her name, Regina arose, and stood in some embarrassment, whereupon Mr. Fairweather, with knightly courtesy, escorted her to the foot of the platform, and, taking the ring from Mr. Dalton, handed it to the girl. "'Miss O'Connell,' he said, "'I've been beaten before.' but this is one of the few times in my life that I am glad to be worsted. Amid another burst of applause, he conducted Regina back to her place, where she was forced to shake hands with and receive the congratulations of nearly all in attendance. Regina was very happy then. Why? Who can tell? She had set her heart on the ring. It had fascinated her. Desire of it had grown with each day, and now it was her very own. And then, too, the kind words, the smiles, the sympathetic looks, of all these people fell like balm upon her innocent heart. For a time the girl was in heaven. She slipped the ring upon her finger and turned it this way and that, watching its changing splendors with all the delight of a child. The poor girl was enjoying her first toy. She was aroused by the voice of Mr. Fairweather. Miss O'Connell, he was saying, in case you should ever wish to part with that ring. Oh, dear, no! interrupted Regina. Never. Mr. Fairweather smiled. Very good, Miss O'Connell, but in case you should, 
call on me at any time. I am willing, or rather, I should be glad, to pay you its market value, which is, I believe, sixty-five dollars. Here is my card with my residence address. Thank you, sir. You are very good. But I don't think that I should care to sell my beautiful ring for even a hundred dollars. I am very, very glad you like it so much, my dear young lady, said the old gentleman. And indeed, his kindly face gave earnest that his feelings were at one with his words. Regina was about to acknowledge his gracious speech, when Mr. Dalton again clapped his hands and called the assembly to order. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, I take great pleasure in announcing to you that, in honor of this pleasant occasion, an occasion for once when the right prize goes to the right person, Miss Rosamond Otis, the gifted soprano whom all Cincinnati delights to honor, has kindly consented to sing a solo. Mr. Dalton held up his hand for silence, and nevertheless the applause continued for nearly a minute. Miss Otis, a tall, handsome young lady, stationed herself beside the piano, and accompanied by the pianist of the occasion, sang, May Morning. The audience was so delighted that an encore was imperative. After a short delay, Miss Otis sang, Oh, believe me of all these endearing young charms. Oh, cried Regina involuntarily, and putting her hand to her heart. Then she addressed herself to listen. Regina had Irish blood in her veins, and no person of Irish blood ever yet listened unmoved to this sweet melody but to Regina it appealed, as, perhaps, it never yet appealed to any listener. Again she was standing beside her dying sister. Again she saw the dear face flush and the gentle eyes kindle under the inspiration of the poet's thought. Despite her endeavors, she could not restrain a sob, and the tears rushed to her eyes and stained her wan cheeks. She hid her face in her handkerchief and listened with all her soul. Miss Otis was at her best on that memorable night. She sang with a pathos which went to every heart. Presently the weeping girl began to wonder where Miss Otis could have got the verses. Regina wore them next her heart. She had shown them to no one save Rose. Here was a mystery to be cleared. With an effort she composed herself. Sir, she said to Mr. Fairweather, aren't they beautiful words? Very, answered the old gentleman emphatically. I know who wrote them, sir. No doubt, no doubt, assented Mr. Fairweather affably. Everybody with Irish blood knows and loves Tom Moore's Irish melodies, and a great many with no Irish blood at all. Myself, for instance. More? repeated Regina, looking puzzled. Yes. Why, what's the matter, my dear young lady? Of course you know that Tom Moore wrote them, as you said. Regina gave a gasp of pain. All the color had left her face. She rose nervously. But what's the matter, Miss O'Connell? Are you ill? Can't I do anything for you? No, no. I... I must leave at once. Excuse me, sir. I wish to be alone. Regina slipped from the hall, and once she was on the staircase, landing outside, she gasped and grew faint, and was obliged to lean against the wall for support. No tears came to her eyes. Her grief was beyond that. The moment of disillusionment had come and a terrible, almost heartbreaking moment it was. Her love was gone forever. She had loved, not Tom, but her own false, though noble conception of that very ordinary young man. But now the ideal had crumbled away, and she stood face to face in her mind's eye with the real, a coarse, selfish, untruthful, weak-willed lover. Grief changed to rage. For the first time in many a long year, Regina was really angry. The great wave of indignant feeling which flooded her soul submerged her reason. She was beside herself. The weakness and the dizziness were forgotten. She went down the steps quickly, her eyes flashing, her bosom heaving, her bloodless lips set together firmly. As she reached the sidewalk, a figure separated from a group of young men who were apparently loafers and came beside her. Mr. Tom Betterly had been awaiting her. She could say nothing just then but she turned upon him a look of contempt that should have warned him. But it would have taken something far more powerful than any look to have warned Mr. Tom Betterly on that occasion. Regina, he said, speaking with that difficulty in pronouncing clearly, which we sometimes notice in those who have just come from the chair of a dentist. Regina, he continued, and there was a beastly light in his eye. 
I congratulate you. I heard you won diamond ring. Is that so? He saw it on her finger. Ah, that's right. Then opening his mouth, he roared, Ka, ka, ka. It was a fearsome sound. Mr. Thomas was rejoicing after the manner of his kind when in his loose tooth condition. He had never before been quite so tipsy in Regina's presence. As with a mighty force of brazen mouth and iron lungs, he croaked forth the third call. He attempted to put his arm around her waist. Then his arm, as it touched the girl, and she drew back, remained fixed as though paralyzed. The blazing eyes of Regina had caught and almost sobered him. Go, she hissed. Go. I never want to see you again. You, you wretch. He stood there while she went on, and he knew that, so far as she was concerned, it was all over with him forever. End of chapter 5